Hi, I'm Dan McMahon, the principal at DeMatha in class of 76. And it's my enormous pleasure tonight to introduce my friend Corey Sobel, who's DeMatha class of 2003. And Corey's going to do a reading from his novel, The Red Shirt. And then we're going to have a little bit of a talk about that and uh, Corey's career that led up to that and what some of the influences on him were. So please join me in welcoming Corey Sobel. Corey. It is a tremendous honor to be back and um, uh, that I'm standing here at all is a testament to how brilliant a teacher Dan is and I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity. So I'm going to read uh, from the, the prologue to the red shirt. Athletes die twice. That's the hoary, comforting, horrifying mantra that circulates among us ex-jocks, and its meaning should be obvious enough. The muscle and speed, the stamina and quickness you spend your best years building up, the discipline and the single-minded drive, all are bound together by the sport. Are you? And as soon as the sport leaves your life, that which united you is gone, and so you are gone too, unraveled like a scarecrow stripped of its stitching. The second you is left to take over, eke out whatever it can before the ultimate death comes. But what nobody has ever told me is what happens to that first self after it breathes its last, where the first you goes. Does your living body become a kind of mausoleum for the corpse and you have no choice but to feel it rot away inside? That would explain the terrible stink I've been carrying around the last 10 years. Friend of Stephen, a man asks. It takes me a moment to realize I'm the one being addressed and another moment to understand that I've been staring. The man is sitting a few stools down the bar. He's 25 maybe, with round-rimmed glasses, close-cropped curly brown hair, and a red Arizona Cardinals jersey whose baggy short sleeves come down to his elbows. He smiles, hands placed expectantly on the bar in anticipation of moving closer. But I have no, I, but I have no clue who Steven is and zero desire to explain to this man that I hadn't been staring at him so much as at his jersey. I shake my head apologetically and look past him toward the entrance. I usually avoid blind dates, but a colleague in NYU's English department has been nagging me to go out with Horace for months, and this week I finally relented. We agreed to meet here at the Raven, a watering hole indistinguishable from all the others in this stratum of western Brooklyn a bar top made of recovered timber, a ceiling of antique hammered tin, light fixtures that are clusters of pendant bulbs with custard colored filaments, the kind of place where the bearded bartender moodily explains the difference between single barrel and blended while the television above him plays vintage music videos on loop, big hair, parachute pants, bold letters that leave a neon residue as they streak onto the screen. Horace arrives. He's about my age, petite and handsome, with a trim black mustache that stands starkly against his pale skin. We shake hands as he takes the stool next to mine, and there is something efficient about him that appeals to me immediately. We run through preliminaries. He's a lawyer, corporate malfeasance. I'm an assistant professor, secularization in 19th century American texts. We have an easy rapport. He's dryly funny and much more confident than I am and within an hour we're already reaching back into our pasts. He tells me about the disaster of his parents divorcing when he was 11, the depression and alcoholism that forced him to raise his little brother on his own. As he talks, I sort through my own traumas, trying to decide which one to trade. I'm not precious about sharing this kind of stuff, except for one thing. I don't tell anyone I used to play football or about the events that forced me out of the game. In fact, I've been so disciplined for so long that I've managed to cultivate a whole community here in the city that has no idea what I used to be. The date continues to go well. Our stools have scooted closer. Horace insists I try his pilsner. I feel happy, buzzed, and am in the middle of explaining the tenure process when a group of men pushes into the bar. Khaki shorts, flip-flops, many of them dressed in Cardinals jerseys, one of them inevitably named Stephen. They gruffly hug the man who tried talking to me, 
and after some cajoling, they prevail on the bartender to pick up the remote and turn the TV to the Sunday night showdown, Arizona versus Green Bay. Want to go somewhere else? Horace asks, which tells me I'm not hiding my panic very well. No, no, this is fine. The fans are harmless as football folks go. They aren't pounding tequila shots or climbing onto the bar. And when one bumps into our stools, he sincerely apologizes rather than calling us faggots with his eyes. But I'm still having trouble concentrating on what Horace is saying, struggling to watch him rather than the game that's flashing in my peripheral vision. Horace himself is growing agitated, and I worry this is my fault until Green Bay scores and the group erupts into booze. With that, Horace sets down his beer, raises his eyes toward the ceiling, and sings out, Enjoy it while it lasts. The fans don't hear it over the broadcast. Horace sighs and says to me, That game is dying. Pee-wee enrollment, plummeting. Ratings, too. The bodies are going to run out, then the money. Nobody's going to even know how to play football in 100 years. And good fucking riddance. Defensiveness rises in me for the game I despise. But speaking out now would only force me to confess everything, so I fake a laugh and clink my glass with Horace's. After taking a sip of his beer, Horace lays his hand on my thigh. He asks again if I want to go somewhere else, except the way he's looking at me signals that somewhere else is no longer a different bar, it's one of our apartments. I say yes, and he smiles and hops off his seat, excusing himself. I watch him walk to the back and join a long bathroom line of full-bladdered Arizona fans. I am fine, I am better than fine, until I look up and see that Rashawn, my Rashawn, is on TV, or at least a photograph of him is. He's wearing dreadlocks these days, designer dreads, short and tight and henna tinted, forming a kind of starburst around his head. He's gotten so muscular that he looks slightly unconvincing, like a sculpture by an also-ran Renaissance artist who mastered individual muscles but lacked the skill to make the muscles cohere into a living, breathing whole. But the eyes work. They're just as I remember them, dark brown, smolderingly intelligent, and I can't believe I'm seeing him, Rashawn. The photograph occupies the top right corner of the screen while a halftime news announcer says, The legal saga continues between the Seattle Seahawks and Rashawn McCoy. McCoy, a six-year veteran tailback, was a lock for the starting spot this season when he unexpectedly announced his retirement from football during training camp. The Seahawks have initiated proceedings for breach of contract. McCoy was in the middle of a three-year, $4 million deal. The announcer moves on to the next item without giving more information. For years, for my health, I've abstained from reading anything about Rashawn, but I can't help myself now and take my phone out to search for mentions. He must have been euphoric when he made the announcement. He must have waited until the worst possible moment to retire just so he could throw his team into chaos. It's over. He's free. The first articles I read focus on the legal battle, but then I land on a more in-depth write-up of what happened. And there, in the second paragraph, is a sentence that makes me feel as if somebody has plunged his dirty hands into my gut and roughly flipped my stomach inside out. McCoy's mother died of a treatment-related infection two days before the announcement. Heat gathers fast in my eyes. The phone screen starts to blur. An insistent phrase, it was all for nothing, repeats over and over in my head, pairing with the image I have of Rashawn's mother, an image that's years out of date, an image I know doesn't reflect all the ravages visited on her body since I last saw her. I try to keep the tears at bay by keeping myself perfectly still, like holding a cup filled right to the brim. That's when a hand lands hard on my back. Have faith, brother! It's the man whose jersey I'd been staring at, he must have been keeping a curious eye on me all this time. Beads of sweat tremble on the top rims of his glasses, and he's so soused that his other hand, the one not resting on my back, is holding on to the bar to steady his wobbly self. We've got a whole, a whole other half to play. Those guys, he lifts his chin scornfully at the television, which his return to the game is showing the Green Bay sideline. They're a bunch of jokers. Jokers. We'll pull through. Something between a sob and a laugh escapes from me. How could I have expected this moment to go any differently? Horace returns from the bathroom. He sees my eyes are red. What? He begins to ask. He's glass half empty, the drunk exclaims, clapping my back again. I told him just wait. Wait till we get going. 
I'm okay, I tell Horace, attempting a smile. The drunk ambles back to his friends, leaving us to try and recover our momentum, but it's no use. Horace gently hints that he knows I'm upset and I play dumb. I can feel myself going cold, resenting Horace for his solicitude, hating myself for resenting him. Soon we're splitting the tab and stepping out into the warm, clear September night. The air is scented with the rich smoke of a nearby halal cart, and down the slope you can see a tiny Statue of Liberty glowing green in the harbor. Should we get, should we get you a cab, I ask? Cab, he says, mock offended. That's not what we agreed to. I'm about to say I'm too tired, but before I can, Horace hooks his arm around mine and asks the way to my apartment. I give in and lead him up 9th Street, passing between brownstones and a line of sycamores where invisible insects make insistent clicking noises that put me in mind of a stove burner failing to catch. Horace tries to lighten the mood by telling me why autumn is his favorite season, but I'm only half listening. Maybe my athletic self has not only been rotting away inside me, Maybe it's also become a ghost that's going to haunt me for however much time I have remaining. The ghost is the voice that taunts me whenever I lose my wind during a morning jog around Prospect Park. The fingers that mockingly pinch the love handles that sit stubbornly on my hips. The saboteur who finds a way to ruin every single one of my dates. We reach my stoop and climb two flights of stairs to my studio. I live in an old brick building that gets stuffy with the day's leftover heat and I crack the windows before retrieving two beers from the fridge. I hand Horace a bottle and join him on my little blue Ikea couch. We sit there in awkward silence, listening to traffic sounds filter into the room from 7th Avenue. Finally, Horace finishes the question he'd started asking back at the bar. What happened? Well, thanks, Corey. Um those events take place about 10 years after the novel ends. Um, and so the rest of the novel is going to go back and walk us through Miles' life. And uh, if we, if as we're talking, you don't want to reveal some particular plot or point, uh, just you know, flag me. And uh, in the meantime, I'd like to thank my colleagues who are here, Ben Cleary and Connor Gawacki and Corey Clumpett, who's directing. And Corey, if you need us to speak better, I'm not sure how uh, the microphone is picking us up here, but uh, you okay? All right. Okay. So, um, Corey, I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, questions and sort of we can uh, talk uh, also about whatever you, you'd like. But some, of, um, some authors that I really admire which you are one, um, have told me that when they're writing, that on occasion, something that a character does surprises them. Uh, Tolstoy is famous for having said that uh, when Anna throws herself under the train, he was shocked. Did, at any point in uh, the novel, did, did something that Miles or Rashawn did or any of the other characters surprise you as you were, as you were writing it? That's a terrific question. Um, I I don't want to directly contradict Tolstoy, um, <laughs> and I didn't. I actually my my quarantine read was War and Peace. Like I, I managed to, to finally read it this year. Um, but I wonder if what he's getting at. So the assumption there is that the the characters. And the book comes to sort of exist outside of the, the author, right? right? And I wonder if what he's getting at, certainly what he's getting at in my experience, is that you find yourself surprised by um, your willingness to do something, you know? Okay. And so it's not, you know, because he's, he's writing it, right? Like it's happening. He is, he is rendering yes, sure. it. And I, I, I don't think he went into a fugue state at yeah. any point while he's writing. Right. But I think what he's getting at is that there is uh, the best moments of writing are when you find that something, if you were just to be in a neutral, non-writing state, you might say, ah, oh, that might not work. Or, oh, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm ready or yeah. able to do that. And then when it comes about, like, it's this very gratifying, exciting yeah. moment, right? So that's a very sort of, that's a, a way of pushing back your, your question while right. I'm thinking of an actual answer. <laughs> um, but I guess something that surprised me 
generally, I don't know if there was a moment, but uh, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, you, you still obviously really love football. And um, you obviously really care about this culture. And uh, I, I would have thought that I, the, the anger and the sort of seething darkness would have been the only experience people had. Right. But I think what they might be picking up on is that there's a warmth that I can't help but sort of impart to this story because I, I experienced that warmth in the game right. myself, you know? Yes. And so if there are humorous moments, or and if, there are. There's a couple of very funny moments. Yeah, or like tender moments or other yes. things that if you were to just, if we were to be at a bar like they are and just talking about football, I'd probably be really ranty and really angry and, and very un, unwarm and, and not, <laughs> not prepossessing in any way. And so I guess I, I would find myself surprised by my willingness to be more generous toward the culture and toward some of these players yeah. and coaches than uh, I, I would have said that I would have been. I suspect that um, because, of course, you're not Miles, right? And I wonder if what people are doing when they ask you that is they, uh, they're they giving you Miles' yes, attitude. Absolutely. And um, though those are not the same thing, but, uh, well, I, I don't... I don't think it's going to be a surprise to say Miles is eventually going to leave the game, right? Yes. And um, he doesn't exactly, uh, he makes the best of a bad situation. He, uh, so in some way he leaves on his own terms, but not by his own volition. Mm -hmm. And the things he misses most about the game are, are the camaraderie and his tremendous desire to be part of this uh, right. team. This, he loves this, this notion um, about that. But at the same time, he, uh, to be who he is, he can't stay in that, right. in that, uh, in that situation. Um, in fact, uh, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, it, he, Miles and Rashawn remind me a little bit of Frankenstein and the creature in the sense that mm -hmm. Victor wants nothing more than to be left alone and to be isolated and society wants him in. The creature wants nothing more than to belong to the society, to find a community that will take him, and he is forced out of out of that. Uh, Miles loves the game and would do anything for the game. Rashawn does not love the game. Uh, the game loves him. It's touched him with the hand of God, um, but he does not want that. Um, and uh, so the two of them, they make such a tremendous uh, pair mm -hmm. uh, who are both at odds and at the same time um, I think come to understand each other in uh, in some way so I, I guess I, what I'd like to ask you about is uh, you uh, chose to tell this in first person narration as opposed to third mm -hmm. person narration uh, can you talk a little bit about what opportunities that provided uh, and at the same time what uh, roadblocks it might have or what it forced you to may have left to the side or uh, to have to come up with ways to work around those. Mm -hmm. There's, I think that third person is so attractive to writers because it gives their whatever talents they have uh, much wider parameters. Um, and they can just, they can be more playful in a lot of senses and they can dip in and out of perspectives. They can uh, dip in and out of the story very easily. And um, the drawback of that for me at least, and in this case in particular, um, was that I needed the reader to sort of go on the journey with Miles in a, in a more direct way and in a less distance way than the third person, even the third person indirect, which is a wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, tool that people mm -hmm. use. Um, but it's, it's wonderful in part because there's uh, irony that can be introduced um, very easily that can separate the character from the reader. And there's a sort of mediating presence there um, in, in the, in the form of he said, she said, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and so I didn't want to lose that irony. And so I had Miles remembering the story and speaking retroactively right. so that there are, at any given point, there are at least two Miles in the story, right? There's the Miles 
who's speaking to us and telling us a story, and then there's the Miles, you know, about whom he's speaking. And so there is, there were just a lot of really fun possibilities with that, where um, I think you collapse that distance, because even if he's telling you about a younger version of him, um, he's going to be telling on himself yes. in some way, right? And so I, I'm really fascinated when people reveal um, things about Miles that I obviously was also telling on myself that I didn't realize was happening, right? And so um, it might be about how naive he is, or a lot of people talk about how observant he is. And I didn't necessarily think of Miles as being very observant. Um, I knew that he was intelligent, but those don't necessarily go together no, all the don't. time. And what w what's very cool is that I look back and I said, oh yes, he's actually, he's extremely observant. He's exacting in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that that, again, he's trying, by being exacting, he's trying to collapse the distance between the Miles telling the story and the Miles who's living the story in some ways. And so there's just, uh, there's an immediacy that the first person gave me um, without an irony that I think would have tempted me to be harsher toward the game and right. maybe toward Miles and Rashawn as well. Right. You know, in a way, it's a novel of secrets. And even though, in fact, the opening is a secret, that uh, it is this Horace's question that triggers the novel, which is the answer to the, to the question, what happened? Um, but of course, Miles, the secret that Miles carries that um, he has to learn to live with is that he's gay. The secret that Rashawn carries, and all these are revealed, so this is not right, the right. big deal. The, the secret that Rashawn carries is that he doesn't love the game and that he is being paid to play college ball, which he is actually doing for a reason that is totally understandable, his mother's health. She needs health care, and this is a way to pay for to, to pay for that. But it, uh, it didn't strike me until you were reading the beginning that Miles is an expert secret keeper. He mm -hmm. kept secrets from himself. He's, as he says, I have lived my life in New York such that no one knows this other so they're part of me, and uh, the terrible toll that takes upon him. And of course, he's carried Rashawn's secret, and then the sort of the big secret at the end, which we won't say, uh, um, with him. Um, I, I like that you said uh, that Miles is observant. I think one of the things that allows, that choosing first person allowed you to do was, characters reveal themselves to right. Uh, so Miles does what a lot of adolescents does. He jumps to a conclusion about somebody, but then as he learns more about them, he adjusts his his view. There's only one or two characters that that doesn't happen with that partially is skilled, but I think partially that is, um, and part of the humor comes from mm -hmm. uh, the from characters who are a little more one dimensional. So. Um, Coach Zeller, yes. uh, whose name sounds an awful lot like Zealot, uh, <laughs> um, is, uh, is a terrific, um, he's an ideologue. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about him and his ability to sort of create a world of absolutes? And he forges secrets. He doesn't reveal secrets. He keeps them or yeah. creates them. A really... So, you know, having played at Duke and having played under uh, objectively and manifestly untalented head coaches, my inclination in early drafts was to have Zeller be, a, you know, not a great coach himself. And a really important moment when I was writing the book was when I realized that he's really good at being a coach. Yes, yes. And that being good as a coach, at least at the college level, means that you are compromised in any number of ways. There's probably a, some kind of, you know, what would it be, like a, a, a positive, negative correlation or whatever would be, you know, uh, so the, that the, the, the better he is in some ways, the less moral he is. Yes. Um, and so what was really freeing about that was he, can embody 
the game's idea of itself in a really extreme way, you know? Mm -hmm. And the, the game loves to think, you know, that there's a reason why football players go into the corporate world and why the corporate America is so deeply incestuously sort of intertwined with football, right? Like it is, <laughs> you know, and so he's, he's a CEO. He's, uh, he's, he's a, a, an executive in a lot of ways. And so um, what was really fun and again kind of freeing about him was you have all of these people who are riven in any number of ways and are constantly trying to overcome those, um, those contradictions and hypocrisies. Yeah. And why, uh, why uh, Zeller is so good at what he does is that he has no compunction whatsoever about hypocrisies. He actually thrives right. on those uh, those antipodal sort of impulses or facts about him, and he's one of the few people in the book who thrives on his contradictions as opposed to being uh, hamstrung by them. Yes, he is utterly unfazed by by those things, and I guess that's what I meant when I said he's an ideologue. There are ways in which. Uh, Perversely, he does do good. Yes, I, I mean there, it yeah. is. Uh, it it uh, it's striking, and I think that that gives him enough humanity. Yeah. To, uh, so um, there's a scene near the end of the as, as the uh, as the kings uh, become or the monarchs, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, as right. they become more successful and everything. Um, there's a scene from a radio show interview which sounds a little bit like every um puff piece radio show yes. in interview um it is and of course since we've been behind the curtain and seen all the stuff and then we get to watch the the interview it is um it's strikingly painful to to read how fun was it to write Super. that particular yeah episode oh so fun i mean dialogue dialogue generally is just really yeah. fun yeah. for me at least um but uh for readers who don't know how it's structured it is it's purely the initials of the speakers and then whatever they say and so there are no there are no cues that you get in normal dialogue right there's no uh he paused and smirked or whatever yeah. it is right and yeah. so what was what was really cool was at that point in the book, you're going to know enough about every speaker that you're hopefully going to be able to fill in yeah. what they are, how they're yeah. looking or, you know, what's right. happening. And there is, there's one moment in which there's just a pause and that pause, if you know, uh, there's a, a, a really fatuous character named Earl who comes in later in the book, yes. um, who has a very antagonistic relationship with Rashawn. If you know about that relationship, then this pause gains really big proportions yeah. right and so um that was it was it was so much fun to do yeah. and um also gave me a chance because what i also try to do is you know the, the team's so bad that people don't care about it and you don't get a lot of the normal claptrap and propaganda that you're that is usually associated with football because people don't care enough to generate right. But as they become better, then the the sort of the, the team starts facing outward, and you get um, the perspective that a new fan yes. to King Football would have on it. Um, and so those later scenes allow me to sort of play with that in a way that it wouldn't have worked in, in earlier. Yeah, they, the book. Uh, th by bringing uh, Errol, who is talented in his own. In his oh, own yeah. way, and Rashawn together, but they don't get along. And putting them with Zeller in that interview, you're right because we know all of that. But to the casual fan outside, this, uh, um, they're they believe that they're being privy to the wonders of uh, teamwork and mutual respect and bonhomie and all this, and that none of that is actually right. is actually happening. So you know. Um, I think it's Wayne Booth, but maybe it was somebody else who's, who's talked about the real importance between showing narration and telling uh, narration. And I think one of the extraordinary things that you accomplish in this is to do so much showing and very little mm -hmm. telling. Um, one of my favorite scenes is a scene, uh, and I won't ask you directly if this is partially something that, uh, that you might have experienced, mm -hmm. but... 
uh, perhaps it, uh, you observed, uh, the scene where as part of the, the testing of the, the men, everybody grabs two dumbbells and they begin to do lunge squats around it. And part of it is, you know, to test themselves and, um, and others. And an enormous amount is shown without being told in this. Can you talk a little bit about that scene as Miles, who also admires the other guys who are, right, who are, who are doing that? Can you talk a little bit about that scene? Yeah, so it's uh, early on in, the, in Miles' first uh, winter semester at King. And so in college football, that's, you know, it's the off season. Yep. And that's when you're expected to build up strength and speed and to essentially build on literally and figuratively, you know, whatever you had the, the, the preceding season. Mm -hmm. And so Miles is competing for the starting uh, weak side linebacker position with Chase McGarren, uh, who's a, a couple years older than he is. And um, the scene, you know, has them marching in a circle. And so Miles is, has uh, a set of floor ceiling windows through which the coaches are watching him. And that's, if you really know yeah. a lot about college football, you know that coaches during the off season aren't technically allowed to right. be with players when they're working out. And so it's a very common way for them to skirt that rule right. by being outside. They're watching it, the players, it, they might as well be in there um, but there's an added sort of unnerving element because you just have these silent judges who are right. behind the windows. And so Miles has the stress of trying to outlast Chase in this lunge competition. He has Coach Hightower, the line, linebacker's coach, looking on. And then he has pain, the, the excruciating pain yes. that's, you know, sort of a third element right. of all this, right? And so um, what I think... I think one of the really big uh, motivations that I had for telling this story was that no one has really exploited just how many narrative possibilities there are in a football story. Right. And how the, the, the really day-to-day -day quotidian things that if you're a football player you take for granted, if you're a novelist, it's, it's a playground and there's so many different things you can do. And so what's beautiful about something as simple as a lunch contest is there's inherent arc to it. Yeah. Um, you know everyone's motives and stakes. And so on the one hand, it's a pretty typical sort of sports scenario. But on the other hand, if you're interested in telling a, a relatively unconventional sports story, you can sort of figure out ways um, to tell it in a new way or to see what weird or uncommon sort of like angles you can take. And so what happens is miles that one of the things and this this lasted through uh drafts is miles at one point has the observation that black players uh when they have bruises or wounds they don't usually show. don't look very bad sure. until they get really bad and then they look terrible yeah and that's much more about miles being um unfamiliar with environments where people right. of color predominate, which right. they do on King's team. Yeah. Um, but it's also um, a way of sort of, it's, it's sort of a little pin to put in his moral journey of starting to see and understand or try to understand the experience of people who he has othered as a, right. a white kid from you know, central Colorado. And so you have that element, and um, it mostly it's just, you know, it, it's kind of like, I mean, we could talk about Moby Dick forever, but what's it's very much, but what's incredible about Moby Dick is the entire book, you know, you know that we are proceeding. Yes. You can feel, even when he's not talking about it, most often when he's not talking about the actual hunt for Moby Dick, you know that it's happening. And so what happens is that the reader feels that they're being carried along, but the writer has all sorts of chances to just sort of look around and play. Right. And in a very modest, in no way comparing myself to Melville's sense, like this scene gave me yeah. one of those opportunities. Yeah, that it's, um, it's terrific. Miles learns a lot about himself in that and what he will survive. And um, uh, you can feel the abrasion on his Hands right. as on his, his, his on the couch. I mean, yeah. and that anybody who's 
done a, uh, either a lunch walk or a suitcase carrier has, has had that. I mean, yeah. you know what that, what that feels like. And uh, there's this enormous sense that when he gets to the end, even uh, the, the kid he loses to in so on, is already carrying 40 more pounds. He's got 275s, not 255s. Right. But there, there, there's this enormous pride that the whole team takes in all of them. And I think that's one of the things that um, it, it gets to about how much Miles wants to belong. And it's the kind of thing, Rashawn might go to the weightlifting, he might go, but he skips team things all the time. He's right. not particularly interested in them. Um, he doesn't feel that need to be right to belong in the same way that right. uh, does so one of the other things about this and we had said this before we started this is really a building sermon it's a story of coming of age mm -hmm. and uh so though it's gradual so i wouldn't say that it, it it turns on a single moment though there's a really powerful uh moment at the uh at the end that does signify a kind of crossing over into uh, what will be a new phase of his of his life? It's really this story of growth mm -hmm. and um, uh, coming to awareness, and part of it is coming to his intellectual awareness. And part of that happens through a professor um, Grayson, who is researching and using Rashawn and a couple of other characters to help him research this this character. So the end note uh, tells us that. This fictional character who's being researched is based on a real character. And um, sometimes when authors know things, they just put in everything they, mm -hmm. they know. But this is a really seamless way. Can you talk a little bit about how, even though this is a first person narrative, it's a novel, it's fiction, that the research went into it and maybe tell us a little bit about that character. Yeah, so the, the character in the book is, uh, uh, Carmichael Scott King right. and call him CSK just for yeah. you know everyone's sort of <laughs> comfort right. um, and he's based on another three yes. named gentleman um, a poet jo George Moses, Moses Horton excuse me um, who was uh, this incredible poet from North Carolina um, who was enslaved in the mid 19th century and taught himself to read incredible yeah and he uh, ended up publishing three books of poetry um, and was uh, you know insofar as someone who is enslaved uh, in North Carolina in the mid 19th century was a bit of a sensation like at least mm -hmm. in, in the Chapel Hill area mm -hmm. um, so I had known about Horton since uh, my sophomore year of college. Wow. Um, so I, I had, uh, I did a, a several African American literature classes um, with this great professor named Maurice Wallace, um, who's at Duke then. And I, it had just always kind of stuck somewhere yeah. that um, I would be really interested in exploring that experience in some way. Um, and there was never gonna be any question that I would do directly or you right. know, in the fir first person. Um, but what, you know, a campus novel, which this book kind of is, yeah. um, allows you to do is it allows you to draw on the, the, the resources of the wider university and by having that ability, you can escape, so to speak, the first person sometimes, or you can escape it and at least the, the narrative that's being told by the, the narrator. And one way to do that is through, um, secondary documents right and through this research that's happening and so that was to go back to you know your observation about perspective it was an end around sorry for the football uh, <laughs> pun um for that sort of problem um but it was also a way for me to sort of widen the scope a little bit in in terms of um the history of using black bodies for entertainment and for yes. profit and horton was both he was a slave and so he was obviously right. being profited off of um but he started uh his poetic career going around the uh, chapel hill campus of the university of north carolina um, extemporizing acrostic poems for students there yes and so um having that narrative there and then having Rashawn research it and Miles learns yeah. about it as well 
give, gave me a chance to have a, you know, that sort of continuum um, that I think is a very important sort of aspect of the college yes. football story and also the story of the university and it's sort of, you know, it factors into what we learn about the, the foundations right. of King. Um, and so I had, it was just one of those things where I, you know, in my, in the new novel that I'm working on right now, um, there is a decent amount of research. The novel that I hope to write after that, there's a ton of research. With this, it was way more strategic. Yeah. And it was, okay, I know I want these things to be mm -hmm. used. I know enough about them having experienced college football. And so a lot of the things that are outside of football were actually the, the, the targeted moments where I could use research. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I knew about Horton, but I didn't know nearly as much as ends up going into the book um, when I started writing. And so like, I got a chance to go through archives that the University yeah. of North Carolina has, and um, I reread re a lot of his poems and actually got to open the big, thick Norton anthology that I still have from college. Yeah. And um, I, I'm really suspicious of books that want to punish you with their research right. and want to Me show too. you, you know, and so yeah. that's why like yeah. Wolf Hall is such a, a miracle, right? Like right. Wolf Hall never feels researched even though it is right. incredibly yes. well researched. And I wanted to have something where the themes were integrated into the story so uh, intuitively that whatever research went into it, like you're not going to notice that because right. you have other aspects of the story and the, the experience that uh, are the primary things that you're feeling or thinking about when it's happening. Right. In some ways, you, one never loses track of the, the narrative. And this is another part of the narrative. And the fact that um, he, uh, CSK, has to become an entertainer and he he himself struggles for an identity and of course he loses an identity right uh, at one point they lose track of him for a certain amount of, of years yeah. and uh, then he appears to come back and in a way of course all the characters are in that but particularly Rashawn and mm -hmm. when Rashawn has that passion to learn that turns out it's surprising to Miles and then Miles finds it both admirable and unusual, but it clearly has an impact because now we know that Miles is a assistant professor at, yeah. at NYU. So um, I, uh, you introduced Melville, so we may as well point yeah. out that uh, okay. you you open uh, <laughs> uh, with an epigraph from Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, a great, wonderful, uh, powerful uh, short story. And um, Rashawn comes to love. Yeah. Melville and um, of course Bartleby's great line is I would prefer not to it's uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, parts is in class when they're talking about that another really smart student Silas turns and says this guy is just antagonistically passive aggressive right. and Rashawn defends him um, defends Bartleby right right so can you talk a little bit about um, your own sort of thinking about uh, about Bartleby. Yeah. Well, I guess we can recap just briefly. He's sure. a Scribner, an amanuensis. He's hired to copy things, right. and he's good at it. And over the course of the novel, he decides he doesn't want to do that, and he stops doing it. And his boss, who's a pretty good guy, mm -hmm. keeps trying to encourage him. Right. And Bart he, Bartleby won't be confrontational. He won't be. But eventually, he just slows down to yeah to a stop. Yeah. And that's all he'll tell us is, yeah. I would prefer not to. Right. I, uh, let me plug your, your class um, <laughs> okay. as, 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 by means of you know, an answer. Um, and the people at home can't see that Dan's wearing an Invisible Man uh, tie. But um, that, <laughs> that uh, epigraph uh, is a super modest nod toward uh, Benito. Yeah. yeah, so we read Invis yes. Invisible Man uh, my junior year of high school. It was tremendously, hugely, uh, boundlessly important for me as a, a writer and as a you know person generally. And the epigraph, one of the epigraphs for Invisible Man is this great little snippet from Benito Serino. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, he's what 
what has cast such a yeah, shadow upon you. you. Yeah. And what I love, love about that, and what a really formative, actually like sub formative experience for me was that um, I didn't read that novella until I was in no. college. Right. And when I read it, there is another line, there's a response to the question and it's the Negro. Yes. And so there's this wonderful ironic usage yes. that Ellison is making, yes. you know, by, by cutting that off. Yes. Um, and so when Bartleby ended up being a really important sort of part of the, my story, and I had remembered this exchange from the end of, of Bartleby after I reread read it, um, it was a way to sort of like, you know, nod toward any number right. of things. Um, but what I love about doing that too is that when you isolate any part of that story, it takes on this sort of extra numinousness, you know, like it just, it, it, it that's why Melville is so incredible is that you can take, you know, yeah. just shards of these stories and they attain their own sort of like whole meaning. And so with the, the epigraph um, that I use, what you have is uh, the narrator at the end of the story coming up to Bartleby, who's in a debtor's prison yeah. and Bartleby's starving to death. He's, he's willfully starving yes. to death. And he and, and the, the narrator who's been baffled by Bartleby the whole time, he says, what, look, you know, even here, things aren't as bad as it seems. You have food, yeah. there's, there's the sky, there's the yeah. grass, like everything yeah. seems to be okay. And, you know, Bartleby knows from the first time that he meets this guy that he's not gonna understand. And this is the last sort of ironic knife twist yeah. of yeah. the story, um, but, <clears throat> What was so important to me for that epigraph is that you could you could have the world be the narrator and Rashawn yes be Bartleby absolutely and, but you could also have it be you know it could be Miles as he's narrating it talking to the Miles and the story or vice versa you know like there's just all these right. permutations that can go into it yeah and. The irony of, especially of taking it out, doing, trying to do what Ellison did, is that um, a reader might not necessarily realize that he, he's literally in a prison. He's telling, yes. he's telling Bartleby to buck up <laughs> right. and that things aren't so bad. <laughs> Bartleby is right. is committing slow motion suicide. Yeah. He is yeah. in the most wretched circumstances, yeah. and he's you know he's not really feeling this 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 exhortation to, right. to, to look on the bright side of things. <laughs> right. So that was, you know, that, that's where that epigraph came from. But more generally, um, Bar I, I, I was doing research on, on Melville for a different reason because Melville all the time, yeah. but um, you know, Bartleby is getting at the fact that during that period of the 19th century, uh, you had a huge number of alienated workers yes who got really pay, poorly paid jobs, really demeaning jobs, dehumanizing jobs, um, like being a Scrivener. Yes, and machine-like jobs. Right, and so this is it's the beginning of mechanization yes, in is. that term, yes, right. and it's about alienated labor yeah. more than anything else, yeah. right? And so alienated labor is just, I mean, that could have been another <laughs> yes. title for my book, I guess. Yes, it could have been. And so, um, it was crazy to reread Bartleby when I knew that that was going to become an element of the story to see that it was just, yeah. it was there in the yeah. book in all these sort of subcutaneous ways and sort yeah. of the work was trying to bring it, you know, above the, the skin. Yeah, there really is this um, this plantation sense to the uh, to college football. Mm -hmm. uh, there just mm -hmm. is. There is staggering wealth at um, the coaching end, yeah. at the booster end and everything else. and. The kids are left with uh, new uniforms, which they're psyched about, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, a new new paint job in the weight room, and they're psyched about. And but it begins to dawn on you, uh, they don't, they can't quite have the the full perspective on what right. they're uh, no, they're part, of. and that's being a cog in the machine, right. which serves you well to be the football player. It just doesn't serve you necessarily as a human being. At, yes. Uh, um, at some point. So um, we'll go with uh, two more uh, questions. Uh -huh. um, so one of my favorite novelists is a genre novelist named George Pelicanos. Mm -hmm. And um, George has several novels in which the central character is black. George himself is Greek, he's not, he's not black. Mm -hmm. And George on occasion faces pushback for writing in right. um, 
voice. And I'm wondering, um, you're neither gay nor black, right? right? Your two central characters are right. those, right. Uh, share those attributes. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, first of all, why it's important for artists to be able to do what, you, mm -hmm. what you've done? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if there's been any pushback. I guess I'd like to hear if you got sure. any pushback from that. I can take the second question first, sure. I guess. Um, so I, the, the book, I mentioned before we, we started taping, but it had this sort of circuitous journey to, to the University Press of Kentucky. And it was submitted to big publishers and it got um, really positive responses and uh, a couple of editors wanted to take mm -hmm. it. Um, but there were reservations about its saleability. Um, they weren't sure if college football fans would want to read a very narrow, a very literary novel, or if literary folks would really be interested in football. And so <laughs> yeah. that was sort of one hurdle. Um, but another was, uh, you know, there's really important conversations that are going on about representation yes. and um, about uh, the depth of experience that any given uh, person with any set of identifiers has and how not only difficult it is to for someone who doesn't have that experience to convey it, but also the the ethics of it and whether that's right. a responsible thing. I think that uh, Jeanette do. Cummins, the uh, author of American Dirt, faced yes. a lot of pushback. Yes, I, I read that novel. I I think she has every right to write. I just don't think it's a particularly good novel. And that's yeah, it, absolutely. But, I thought Don Winslow's The Border Trilogy is way more right. effective about right. that topic. Right. But she has every, I mean, my, but I can see why publishers would be yeah, they're, you know, uh, and, hesitant to yes. talk something and then you have to answer, you know, in a right. series of angry, you know, questions from people saying, how dare you write in this, right. this voice. And I, you know, at that point I had had, uh, I had had black readers, I had had gay readers, I had had plenty of people who would have been like, oh man, just try again. Yeah. Or you got this wrong. Take a different, yeah, take a different sort of attack or whatever it is. Yeah. And I certainly wasn't perfect and I certainly no. would never claim that, but I, I got enough um, affirmation yeah. from readers who had the experiences in some way, yeah. uh, in some senses of my characters uh, that allowed me to, to feel like I was doing an okay enough job to keep going. And so um, from that perspective, uh, I've only, so far, like people have not had issues with it. I would understand mm -hmm. if I start hearing that um, and I'd be totally happy to talk to people about it. Um, but I think it kind of comes down to, I, you know, I was thinking about it actually the other day. Um, that you have in this conversation, what's getting missed a lot is just how many gaps a reader is going to fill in no matter yes, what. absolutely. And how important and obviously central the reader and what the reader does to complete the book yes. is. And so my task, as I saw it in this book, was not to, at every single point, um, in a positive sense, represent what the experience of a gay player or a black player would be. It was to not, it was in a more negative sense where it's, I don't want to get in the way of the reader being able to imagine themselves into this story. Right. And so in that, and that, that might sound passive, but it's actually super no, active I, and very... I think that actually is I, what I was going to say, because I don't have the, those, either of those experiences. But I do have the memories of um, sort of falling in love and mm -hmm. that first uh, overwhelming sense of passion. And right. those things, in some ways, um, uh, if you drill down far enough into the individual, you can find universals. And you're right. You, right. You, at some point, you've got to trust that the reader is going to complete some of those right. things and, those and, things for you. And so I think actually what, what doesn't necessarily happen with discussions of stereotypes often is that stereotypes they're they're nauseous they're noxious and, and awful and you know destructive in any number of ways they're also really distracting yes. and they're also they're just sort of these if you're listening to a symphony it's a horn flooding or it's you know yeah, someone right. dropping your drumsticks or something right. like that it's just a fundamental sort of wrongness yeah. that breaks 
the illusion that the writer and reader yes. uh, pair up to create, you know? Yeah. And so if you can, if you're just sort of willing to work hard enough to make sure that those aren't there, that you aren't um, clanging in this figurative right. sense, then, you know, you're going to give the reader a chance to sort of, right. you know, put themselves in the book. And so that's, that's the, the long-winded response to the first part of the question. And the second part is that um, they both actually share a ton of experiences with me. And they both have yeah. uh, journeys and thoughts and other things that uh, are, are very central to my experience of football and my experience more generally and so what why i'm a novelist as opposed to a memoirist right. is that i'm looking for a way into my own experience right i would say they're fiercely imagined right but so even that the you may be drawing from a deep well of your of yourself but the imagination still is what allows you to go into those but, right and ask all sorts of other questions right you know and so it, they're 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 mostly just if, if i were if i could be a memoirist I'd certainly make a lot more money off of this book. <laughs> but like, but in, in the case of the memoirist, uh, they are, they're at least, at least the illusion is that you are able to and allowed to directly enter into whatever experience you want right. to write about. With me, I can't do that because I'm too self-loathing in any number of things. <laughs> like I just can't, I can't directly face up to those experiences. Yeah. And so what, Fiction generally, and then Miles and Rashawn specifically allow me to do is triangulate. Yeah. And so I start here, yeah. I can, I, my experience is over here, and by using both of them, they can get at this thing yeah. that I'm being blocked through any number right. of emotional, yeah. you know, handicaps that I have from accessing right. just by walking straight through, you know? It, be, uh, it reminds me, um, when I taught, uh, Baldwin's Notes of a Native Sonny is a great line in it where she says, uh, I want to be an honest man and a good writer. And I have looked at it students and said, that's the most insanely ambitious line. <laughs> I mean, th those two things. And right. lots of students will look at me like, oh, come on, how hard can that be? Right. And I think to myself, oh my God, he just picked the two hardest things of all to do. Yeah. Be honest and then be a good writer. Holy right. smokes, how right. would you get to that? Right. You know? um, Okay, uh, so um, a couple of um, uh, writers who uh, you admire, or but you know what, um, that's uh, too cheap. How about uh, um, this? Uh, a good science fiction writer I know named Aldous Budras, mm. he died recently, but he was, he wrote two really good science fiction novels in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s. And then he became the critic for Galaxy Magazine. Uh -huh. And he reviewed in five years more than 300 novels. Staggering pace. Yeah. The reviews are brilliant. Yeah. They're terrific. He quit that job and could not write a novel. Yeah. It took him 20 more years. And when he was asked about it, he said he couldn't turn off the critic's voice in his head. He had done this, and of course, when I knew you, you weren't a fiction writer, you were a literary critic. You were yeah. a burgeoning thinker about this. And when you went to Duke, you similarly became a scholar yeah. in this, this way. So can you talk a little bit about how you, how you turn off the, or how, how do you approach so that as every line you write, you don't think, oh my God, that's derivative of this other yeah, thing I read. Yeah, oh my God, this, you know. Yeah. Uh, in a, a very technical sense, I have a, a tool that short circuits my inherent self-doubt and self-loathing, which is I write my first drafts longhand. Oh, very good. And what the secret is, in my case, is my handwriting so horrible <laughs> that it takes me a lot of work to reread what I've written. And so if I want to get anything done, I can't write something and then try to go through it because I will, right. I will spend so much more time just trying to decipher what I'm re what I've read uh, written yeah. than I, you know, that I could be using to write otherwise. So what's great is that I just fill these composition books with chicken scratch 
and I can sort of ignore my impulse oh, to, to critique yeah. because I, I physically can't do it easily because my writing, like I, I will, if, if I spend too much time away from something I've written, I'll sometimes not be able to understand what I wrote. Wow. And so like, that's the sort of other side where there's a ticking clock where it's like, you gotta get to it eventually because you're not gonna right. understand it otherwise. Right. Um, but I think ultimately it's, I mean, I, I mean, there and there are, are incredible people who manage to do both. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, Borges yep. is right. is maybe the greatest example. Yep. Virginia Woolf was amazing. Right. At it. Um, like G.K. Chesterton, yes. like all sorts of people, yeah. like manage to do it. Right. Um, and in my case, um, I guess it's that my the stories that i write have to be so deeply personal and so urgently personal that i feel like i have no choice to write them that's great and those are not subject to the same right rules or exigencies that um apply when i'm reading something you know right. like something that i haven't written or that you know right when we're talking about like the critical kind of mind yeah um but i will say what i love about writing fiction is that the, the best part of it is not that initial process where I'm just like furiously trying to outrun myself by yeah. writing everything down before like I can stop myself. It's revising and it's getting to the point where I actually feel like I am myself a, uh, I'm performing exegesis on yes. my own work. Right. And what's so thrilling about doing this and then my new book is that you get to a point where you where where I felt that I have become an expert in my own writing in this particular case, so yeah. that I can, you know, I could I could tell you at any given point, like if so, what when I know that the book's really coming along is when I need to get to a certain section, I'll know a word from the paragraph I need to get to, and the word probably won't have recurred that many right. times, so I can just go straight to it. Wow, and so. Um, that's not a sign of any special memory. No. It's just that I've worked on it enough. Right. And that also gets at maybe a last point, which is that if you work on a book enough, it starts to separate itself from you. Yes. And so I, I, right. hate, I hate looking at my book, touching it, opening it, because it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's mine anymore. Right. And I think that that's a very natural, it's a psychological coping mechanism, yeah. but it's also just a sheer result of if you've read and rewrote yeah, right. rewritten this thing enough then yeah. it's going to it's going to uh acquire its own kind of existence yeah i mean jonathan swift uh, wrote a great book called the tale of a tub before he wrote gulliver's mm -hmm. travels and uh later in his life in his diary he recounts having reread a tale of a tub yeah and he writes what a genius i had upon me then yeah it was literally like he was reading of somebody else's book yeah and it yeah. had taken on this other right uh, this this other life and i know the flip side is that like philip roth when he re-released when the the uh, modern library yeah or library of america okay, editions of his books came yeah. out uh when he went on air he refused to read from the early ones because he said i will not i will not wow. read those and I think it's because he was disgusted by himself. Yeah. But right. I also, it's also you're you're having returned to you right. an experience or a self that you're you 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 might have right. moved on from for right. any number of reasons, yeah. you know, psychological right. or otherwise. Um, and so you kind of you kind of expel a book, you know. Yeah. Right. And hopefully, you know, what's what's so ironic is you want that thing that you want rid of to last. <laughs> you just don't necessarily want to have to look at it or, you know, read it yeah. or talk about it. Right. So that seems like a great place to end. And I, I hope this book finds a wide readership. And um, I can't tell you how, uh, how thrilled we are to have you back at DeMatha. And um, uh, when the, the next book comes out, uh, we'll sit down and do it again. Oh, I can't okay. wait. Yeah. All right. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Corey. Thanks to my colleagues here. Uh, to math, that is uh, just terrific, okay?